Come on, give her a big hand. Woo! Hallelujah. Well, if you, you know, move around a little bit, if you need to rub something that needs to be scratched or you need to stretch, uh, bend over, touch your toes, check your neighbor, make sure they're still breathing. <laughs> Pastor Dick out. that was phenomenal. Give him a big hand. Wow. You are so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's white chocolate right there. <laughs> oh. Father, we're so thankful to be in your presence, Lord. We thank you for the deposit that's already been made in our lives this morning. And Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that will continue to manifest your goodness in our lives. In Jesus' name, and all that agree, said amen. amen. Well, this morning, I'm, you may be seated. I'm going to jump right into what I believe I was supposed to share with you. And so we're going to talk and continue on uh, gender roles, something that um, I wrote a book about and released earlier this year. It's something that in my life, Family and marriage has been revolutionary. I went to Johannesburg a couple years ago and was in a women's conference over there with Pastor Ray McCauley and sat on a panel and Shauna McCauley, Pastor Ray's sister-in-law, started talking about the subject on biblical equality and we had a conversation about it after the session and she shared some resources with me and information that literally changed my life and just turned it upside down. So I text my husband on my way back home. I said, babe, I'm not the same. Yeah. And um, lo and behold, make a long story short, our marriage is better now than it ever has been in 30 something years. So I say that because I realize that, you know, the enemy from beginning of time has always been after relationships. He's always wanted to create this enmity, this division, this hatred, this wall between sexes, between male and female, like we talked about on yesterday, between husband and wife, um, children and parents. It just goes on and on and on. And so, you know, if we can really understand uh, how God sees us and how God values each and every one of us in his plan overall, then we can be able to live the best life and be the community that the earth needs to see. And so um, yesterday we talked about what submission is not, and we talked about what submission is. And so we won't belabor or repeat that again, but I would encourage you to get some of the tapes and just all the series because this is really, really good information. So this morning we're going to talk about gender roles and really uh, talk about it because I know for Creflo and myself, we both kind of went into marriage based on our parents' roles. And so a lot of times that's what happens in marriage. And so you uh, begin to take on what you think a man is, or you take on what you think a woman is, or you uh, many times can be a victim of just wrong believing, wrong teaching. And so, you know, there were a lot of things that we were taught that were not um, in line with scripture. And so we have to understand context. Context is king. And so for so long, we've taken English words to try to match Hebrew words or taken things from Webster Dictionary and, and, and made them uh, Greek definitions or to try to interpret the Bible, which is a total different language, a total different translation. And so these are things that if we're not careful, we'll live wrong because we believe wrong. And so until we learn how to believe right and understand what grace is, and it's not just, you know, I can just uh, cuss somebody out because I got grace, or I can just go and slap somebody or shoot somebody because I can, you know, ask God to forgive me. But how I many you know it's more to it than having uh, these limited definitions of what God's word is and to really dig into what his heart is, what his intent is, what his best is 
what his dream is for our lives. And so for us, it's really rediscovering the Christian life all over again, rediscovering marriage all over again. We're empty nesters now. Our youngest is about to be a junior in college. And I'm telling you, we're having the best time. You know, we're doing cops and robbers. We're doing all kinds of games. And I mean, it's just the best, the best of the best. But that's because we've understood what a lot of people have already known about living in equality. For us, it was a level of inequality. And so for a long time, you know, I just put a lot of pressure on him and, and all the responsibility on him and, and um, really didn't take the potential of what the Scripture said concerning what God wanted me to do in the fullness to a certain degree. But there were so many other things that I learned that I could have been doing. But, you know, when you know more, how many know you do more? And so we're uh, making up for lost time. And thank God that, you know, the canker worm is defeated in Jesus' name. And and the thief has been found. And so, you know, we can understand not to just compartmentalize our lives and factor in the grace of God where our roles and responsibilities are concerned. He's a much better cleaner than me. I mean, he can clean. It, you know, it'll look like I was there, that I kind of did a little something, you know, but Crevo, just his upbringing, and, and we talk about, you know, just the things, the graces that he has and the things that he's gifted to do and the gifting that I have. And so when we can not just base things on gender, on who does what, you know, I'm the, you're the wife, so you're supposed to do all the cleaning, or you're the wife, you're supposed to do all the cooking. And, and, and you know, these are things that society has placed on us, limitations. And so, you know, this is 2017, and we have to tap into the grace of God and not live based on 1920 when there was only one breadwinner, the traditional roles. How I many you know now there are more than one bread when in most instances you may have both who are uh, providing for the family. So you have to understand how to make those adjustments and understand what works for you. Men are nurturing. Women are not just nurturers. Men can be very nurturing because God is a nurturer. He's tender, he's caring, he's loving. But for so long, you know, we base manhood on, you know, things that were not based on nurturing. But I'm thankful today that, you know, regardless of what society says, that men are taking their rightful place as what God has designed for them to be. And as we look at some of the scriptures, we can really understand this. And so we can't allow society to compartmentalize our lives and to determine what we should be doing, but you have to pray and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to your life. And so I um, wrote a book and some of the things that we won't be able to really go into depth in, but I would encourage you to get a copy of it. I'm going to sign some copies afterwards and, and um, really just touch on some of these things today. And so before, there was a biological determination of what roles were. Um, men were stronger than women, so the men went to hunt, and women were biologically equipped to care for the kids. And so roles were less complicated in the traditional sense. Roles were less complicated when, you know, June Cleaver stayed home and, and Wally went out and took care of the family. You know, Wally, you know, Wally, just do what you're supposed to do, and I'll take care of Beaver, and, and uh, you know, just, just, you know, Beaver's Beaver, but things were less complicated back then. You know, Ricky Ricardo and Lucy, right? Things were real simple, real simple. But, you know, fast forward things, we got technology, We've got a lot of things to make our lives better, innovation. We have the Holy Spirit. We're not in the dark ages. Thank God we don't have to live under the law where somebody has to tell us what God is saying. But how many of you know the Holy Ghost is, lives on the inside of us and we can hear the wisdom of God for ourselves? 
So there was less of a, a, a complication and roles and skills were established in terms of who did what and the roles that were uh, expected to be carried out. And they were dependent upon one another. The family, the wife and the children were dependent upon the husband to be the sole provider, the sole source of income for dependence in order to have security and for survival. But as we want to mention today that biology does not determine male and female roles in the way that uh, things were. And so we now are trying to figure out, men are trying to understand what it means to be a man. You know, as women, we say, man up. And so a lot of men are trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean? What is expected? And, you know, um, women, somebody may say, you know, don't be so bossy. Okay, so what does that mean? So everybody is trying to decipher and to discern because things are different. Not just the man is bringing home the bacon, but women are bringing home the bacon. Say amen, ladies. Amen. And so as a result of that, gender roles and things can become confusing, and people don't know what to do and who to do what. And our dependence upon each other is in a different type of way. My parents both work had successful careers, so after we had our kids, I was looking to do the same thing. My mother was an educator for 30 years and loved what she did, and I um, wanted to do the same thing. And so, you know, after we had our children, Grandpa said, you want to stay home? No, I don't want to stay home. I want to do what I saw my parents do. I want to live like my mother lived. And so, you know, we had to understand some things because we can't force the expectation upon one another based on maybe what we've experienced, but we really have to be sensitive to the grace of God and to the gifting of God and even to know where our situation is. We've got to locate ourselves. We try to live other people's lives, but what is it that God wants you to do? What is it that God has purpose for your life, because in your purpose, you'll find your worth and your value. When you determine your, your value, when you determine what it is that, that God is grace for your life, then your life will be able to be lived at its fullest potential. And so when we understand what Ezra is, like we talked about in Genesis chapter 2 on yesterday, how the word Ezra that God created as a female that would be help for Adam. Um, the help would be one who would be corresponding to him. And even in the Shema, she talks about being face to face. Someone who um, would even be in some instances against him and would present opposing information to him. And so we have to understand that roles have been designed by God to complement and to benefit each other. To complement and to benefit each other, not to compete but to benefit each other. But I think for so long, because we've not understood things in the church, we've only seen one gender in the pulpit, we've only seen, you know, certain limitations of roles that we've gotten behind and we've lost our voice and we've become ineffective. But how I many you know in 2017, the church at, at its best is diverse. The church is multi uh, racial. The church has multiple, just both genders and everybody flourishing in the, in the purpose and the calling on their lives. Amen? So, one of the things that we've determined is that we've linked our identity to our roles. We have linked who we are to our roles. And so, as a result, if we don't link our identity to the Word of God, then we'll be limited in many ways. So we have to rethink in terms of our purpose and not in terms of our roles. And so, a couple things here. We must define our worth based on God's purpose, not on societal roles. 
We have to learn God's vision for our lives, and that only comes by spending time with the Holy Spirit, that we can learn His purpose for our lives, that we can know what it is that we've been created to do. The writer writes that it is God's greatest joy that we walk and we live in truth. And so that is the Father's plan. As I mentioned on yesterday, that God has not created men and women to dominate. Um, God created men and women to dominate earth, not one another. God created men and women to dominate earth, not one another. God's plan was for individual strengths of men and women to combine to produce exponential result, uh, result, results. I'll read that again. His plan for individual strengths is for us to be able to come together to combine them to produce outstanding exponential resu uh, results. Adam and Eve fell because they stopped looking to God for purpose and they began to look to one another for their identity. And the results of the fall was that man's kind relationship was broken. There was a loss of the balanced relationship between the man and the woman and the loss of human dominion over the world. We looked at on yesterday that as a result of them eating of the fruit of the tree, that the Bible says that Eve, your desire would be to your husband and he would rule over her. And so that was not God's best. That was a result of the fall. And so in many ways, we've taken that scripture and we've said forever, women are doomed and women are under the curse and all kinds of things. But thank God for Jesus redeeming us all from the curse of the law. And it took a woman that Jesus used to restore and to birth our Savior into yeah. the earth. Amen? Amen? So these are things that we must be uh, understanding. Submission is an act of the will and cannot be forced. We talked about submission on yesterday. If submission is forced, it's considered violence, abusive, and dangerous. Sub submission to God or submission in general is not abuse. Men and women are created equal and they are different. So the scripture says in Genesis 1 verse 26 that both were created to have dominion and to have authority. And because they have different purposes and, de and different designs, their authority is manifested and carried out in different ways. A woman is not less than a man because she is a woman and a man is not more than a woman because he is a man. Their differences are necessary because of the gifting and the purposes of God. And purpose is based on vision and how we move forward in life. And they both were given a vision by God. So we all have to ask ourselves, who are we in God and what is our overall purpose? And what is our purpose as an individual? And as we begin to understand that, we can be able to operate in the fullest potential that God wants us to experience. Now, this morning, we want to look at this word head because chances are we are limiting God. We are limiting God by believing wrong, and when we limit God, we fail to experience His best. So we want to look at this word and just kind of do a study of it. So if you would look with me in the book of Colossians, and then we're going to look at Ephesians. Coloss Colossians chapter 1, the Hebrew meaning of the word and the Greek meaning of the word are two different things because for so long we've just based the word head from Webster Dictionary, and we said, okay, he's the head of a department. He's the head of a company. Um, and we've taken... English definitions and use them to describe Bible definitions of things. But we want to look at this word, kafali, in the Greek. Look at Colossians chapter 1. It says in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, 
who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So when we look at this word, kafali here in, Ephi in Colossians chapter 1, 18, it's talking about extremity, the extremity of the body while the feet is on the other extreme, but the head is the opposite extreme of this word. So when we understand what it's talking about here, and we read it in context, we can be able to put together what it is that God wants us to understand about the body of Christ, because we all have a part to play. We all matter. We all have value. We all have significance. We all have importance, but he is the head. And that's the extremity of what he wants us to get here in Colossians 1, verse 18. Now look at chapter 2, verse 19. Colossians chapter 2. Just want to walk you through a couple of scriptures in Ephesians as well. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and, Lord Jesus, hands, is that what that says? Bands, thank you. Having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. So not holding the head from which all body and joints and bands, nourishment minister to, so forth and so on. Now, this word here in Colossians 2, verse 19, is talking about him being the source, a source of life, a source that nourishes all the joints, all of the bands, all of the parts of the body. It is from him that we get our nourishment. That's how we get the life of God is from being nourished by him. And through him that we have our life in him, which is the Zoe kind of life, the highest kind of life, the best life, not just a shabby old life, you know, where you just live in sin and practice sin and just, you know, hope that you get in. But no, the best type of life. I didn't get saved to live a shabby kind of life. I mean, you know. I can relate with Greg's testimony. I did a lot of dope. I guess they put the, the drug dealers, the dope, dope people who did dope on the first half today. But, <laughs> but you know, I, we thought we were living, right, Greg? We thought we were just, you know, living the best life and, you know, that high, right? Just, man. But that wasn't the life that God wants us to live. Right. Amen. But you got a lot of people who just think, you know, they can't relate to God's Word. They can't relate to the life of God because they don't see it. And that's why we got to model it. We can't go around looking like we sucking on a lemon and we mad and we stressed out. We're defeated in our marriages because we, if you want to live in inequality all your life, that's fine. I ain't trying to change anybody's marriage or your family. But for me and Creflo, it works for us. And I'm not going back to inequality, living in inferiority, and just, you know, making myself, trying to talk myself into submission, and just, you know, all of this stuff, and, and uh, mad with God, and all these different things. But I'm, I'm at a place, and I encourage you to get at a place where you can get the life of God that nourishes you each and every day, that you can reach your highest potential, and you can pass it on to your kids, and they can reach their highest potential. They're not mad at God. They're not mad at church. They're not mad at us, their parents. But I'm telling you, it's time for us to get this thing right and not be silent anymore. We've got to, and we've got to own the mistakes that we've made and just, hey, I didn't know. I did what I knew. I lived what I thought was right. But I'm telling you, today is a new day. It is time to cross the threshold. And so when we understand what head is, it's not, you know, everybody trying to compete with each other to be the head. And it's not um, the male bossing everybody else around. You know, the roaches are running and the dog is running. And, 
You come home, it's just, you know, tear on wheels, you know, so it's like, oh, no, that's Old Testament God. Terror and fear and wrath. And so we have to understand that God is life. He's the purest form of life, amen? And that's the life that he wants you to live, the Zoe kind of life. Now, let's look at a couple of the things here. Um, Colossians chapter, well, let's go to Ephesians 4. Let's just go there for a minute. And then we'll go to 1 Corinthians because that's a big one. Ephesians 4, verse 15. I'm going to try and read from my Bible. I think I need to get some bigger words. <laughs> I'll get a longer arm, get one of those reaches, you know, that kind of, where you can. Um, Ephesians 4, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So he says, rather, let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. And we've got to be excited about the truth. I don't know about you, you should be tired of living the lie. I mean, you know, that just gets old after a while that we just live in lie and live in deceit and live in deception. But he says that we should express truth in all things, speaking truly, that we speak the truth of the Word of God, that we're honest about what we say. We're honest with God. If we can't be honest with other people, at least be honest with God. Yeah. Speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. So important for so long, church has been about just playing games and, and uh, just going through the motions and out of obligation and religion has defeated and abused and created so much harm in the lives of people. And so when we can be able to understand what living in truth is and speaking the truth in love, that we can be able to grow up in Christ into all things. And I mean, you know, it's time for us to grow up. Grow up in grace. Amen? Amen. Grow in grace. Enfolded in love, he says, let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, again, uh, we want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's turn there for just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we see that in Colossians, he's the exalted originator and completer, and then he's also our source of life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll see head being used here as our source, again, as our base and the derivation. Our source, base, or derivation. Or meaning how something came into being. From whom something exists. Or how something derived. Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Now I pray you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now, when we look at this, we're talking about, again, the derivation and how the woman came into being was through the man. 
and how Christ gave birth to the man. So I guess if we were to say here that the source of every man is Christ or that the man derived from Christ, the derivation or the basis of the woman came from the man, which was Adam, which we read on yesterday, that she came out of his side, and that uh, the head of Christ is God, and how Christ came out of God, operated as God on the earth. Amen? So look over at Ephesians chapter 5, because this is a big one as well. We looked at this on yesterday. This word head means top, crown. It can mean the source of a river, the head of a river from which something proceeds from. But it does not mean one who dominates, lords over. In fact, that was one of the things that Jesus came to adjust because he mentions in Matthew, he says that you lord over each other and you dominate, exercising lordship over another. But he says, this ought not to be so, but model service, model love, model servanthood, model putting someone else before yourself, model deferring and yielding to others. And so we have to be able to see these things so that we can believe right, and as a result, we can live better and live right lives. Because chances are we've used the English dictionaries to define a lot of things that really were different definitions when you go to it in the Hebrew and you look at it in the Greek. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 we read this, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, we'll insert right here in the original Greek, just so you know, the word submit does not appear in the original text. This was inserted by the privilege of the translators. So that's why I'm saying you've got to really understand some things. The word submit does not appear in the original Greek. Of course, the implication is to verse 21, because they all were to submit to one another. And it's not just, you know, a marriage thing. It's for everybody. Singles are to operate in submission. Submit ourselves first and foremost to God. Resist the devil in what? It says he'll flee from us. Then in verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, if Creflo bumped his head, and like I told y'all on yesterday, and he wants to, me to bring some strippers home, we can't do that. If he says, uh, you know, let's just watch pornography all night long. No, he would never do that. But I'm just saying, we've got to use our brain, folks. <laughs> Amen, church. Amen. It's the truth. Amen. Ladies, you don't have to get permission from your husband on when to go to the bathroom. But we've abused this, and the abuse, I decree and declare, is over yeah. in Jesus' name. And so, in Ephesians, we see here in verse 25 that he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So even if, you know, you're not in preparation to, um, even though you may not be married, 
and you're single, but we're also in preparation for uh, the return of the Lord and to submit to Him and to practice this area of submission for everybody. And so he says in verse 28, so men to love their wives as their own bodies, and he that loves his wife loves himself. For no man yet hates his own flesh, but what? There it is again, nourishes and cherishes it. Nourishes and cherishes it. So same thing that we looked at in Colossians, where Jesus is a source of nourishing us, nourishing the church, cherishing us. If we can only get a hold of how much the Father cherishes us this morning. And that he's not just looking down to try to, you know, browbeat somebody or find out where we're doing wrong, but he nourishes and he cherishes. And so he says, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body. Talking about us all being a part of the body of Christ. I mean, you know, if we're all a part of the body of Christ, I mean, you know, we should all be able to use our gifts to be able to operate in our callings, to be able to reach our fullest potential. I mean, you know, we should all be able to get up to the bat and take a swing. Glory be to God. And how many of you know the Father wants us to hit a home run? He wants everybody. It's not just for one gender. It's not just for some. But I'm telling you, we all get a chance to hit the ball and get to swing. And so he says, for no man hates his flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord. For we are members of his body. And even though, you know, I might be the spleen or I might be the pancreas or I might be the gallbladder, but how many know, man, it starts acting up, you know something is wrong. <laughs> I might not be, you know, the extreme or whatever, you know, I might just be on the other extreme, but it's all good. We all have a part. We all matter. We all value. We all have a role. We all have a responsibility. We all have a grace. Yeah. Amen. So, he says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined his wife, the two be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife, see that she reverence her husband. So, that word there in Ephesians 5 is a source of love. It's a sacrificial servant. It's a source of nourishment where it provides and brings to completion just like Jesus as the church brings us to completion. He helps us to mature in him. He helps us to grow. He enables us. He equips us. And so we can be able to understand what this word means so that we can begin, begin to live right and believe right. And as a result, we can do the things that God has called us to do. Now, got a few more minutes. Y'all learning something? So what are limits that are appropriate in the Christian life today? What are limits that are appropriate? In fact, there should be no limits because God talked about to the children of Israel that they were tempting him because they limited God. And, and um, so we have to change our thinking about the opportunities that we all have to be used by him. So I'll ask you a couple of questions. Can a woman be redeemed as well as men? Should they not share the truth which set them free the same as men do? Can women receive Christ into their lives the same as men can? Should Jesus be restricted from doing through a woman what he is free to do through a man? Are the promises of Christ for women the same as they are for a man? Should women not share those promises, act on them, minister to others for the same reason that men do? 
Are women less valid, less believable, less effective when shared and acted upon by a woman than by a man? Should women withhold from people the sharing and announcing of scriptures which all Christians believe should be disseminated to every creature? Is the power of God measured by the sex of the voice that announces it? Was the blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins of women as well as for men? Can women be saved, justified, restored to God the same as men are? Are women who believe and accept Christ declared righteous as men are? Is the male voice more holy than the female voice? Is the male voice more redeemed, more justified, more restored, more righteous than a female is? Is a female figure more less worthy than a female figure? Can the male eyes see the needs of human suffering better than the female eyes? Can the male ears hear the cry of those in anguish better than the female ears? Does a woman have two feet the same as men do? And are they made to walk with as much as a man's are? Should her feet not go with the gospel as much as his should? Is the gospel less effective when carried by a woman than when it is carried by a man? Is the spirit of the living God in a woman less real, less effective than in a man? Does the Holy Spirit yearn to bear witness in a woman and be silent in a woman than he does in a man? Does the anointing of the Holy Spirit have a different purpose in a woman than he does in a man? Is the Holy Spirit sexual? Is the word of God sexual or the promises of God sexual? Is redemption sexual? Is the ministry sexual? Is faith in God's word sexual? Are the fruits of the Holy Spirit sexual? Is sin measured according to a sex that commits it? But we've made sin the issue. We made and magnified. Is salvation proportioned according to the sex that receives it by faith? Are wings given to a female bird the same as to a male bird? Can she fly less or lower or slower than he? I'm telling you, men better watch out because we get ready to take over. I'm telling you, women, we are taking our place in the body of Christ, not sitting back, waiting for an opportunity, but we're going hard after God with everything that we have so the body of Christ can come to its fullest potential, so we can do what God has called us to do, a body that is full and edified and nourished every part functioning at the highest potential and fulfilling the will and the purpose of God. Do women possess voices the same as men for the same reason? Do women have eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to think, arms to reach, hands to help, hearts to lift, feet to walk and work the same as men? People of God, I rest my case. Shut up now. <laughs> Listen. Man. And for if there's any guy in here thinking, well, this is like women liberation, you missed the whole thing. 
If anything, it's male liberation. So all of the stuff you've been carrying on your shoulders all this time, because you didn't think you had someone else that can help you out, they had a grace, they had an anointing. It's interesting, when you're here for the first time, you, you have to really think about it. The dispensation for Genesis chapter 3, 15, that gave this man the right to rule this woman, Jesus had to come in the dispensation of grace and says, now in Christ you have equality. Well, a woman shouldn't pastor church. I don't know why. That's all they did in, in, in Paul's day. They were pastoring little house churches and stuff like that. Absolutely. And you have to change your thinking there because if Christ is the one that allows us to come on the inside of him and he defines us based on our being in him, and then you say a woman doesn't have the same thing, there's something real wrong with that. And what it's done over the years is cause a woman to operate in a shame and that anointing on her is never released and we're never complete because religions told her you need to just sit there and be quiet and look cute and I got this. That ain't how that works. The church ends up missing out on what it needs. The marriage ends up missing out on what it needs. And it never comes to this place of completion. And then this guy who can't even add trying to keep up with the money in the household, and he's not even graced to do it, can't even multiply. I don't even know how to use a calculator. And y'all finances are all jacked up because he's not graced to do that. He's graced to cook. But because of that religious dominating thought, he in there trying to pay bills, and he's got an expert in the house who knows finances and accounting like nobody's business, but for the sake of what he's heard religiously and traditionally. And watch this. And then the preachers will tell you, you need to get your wife under control. What the heck is that? Like she's a little puppy dog. You put a little choke collar on her and say, now do what I tell you to do. That old dog ain't going to hunt no more. That's over. That's, and then I see women who, who submit blindly. Well, my husband said to do it, so I'm going to do it. Well, the last thing I want around me as a leader is yes men. I can't grow with yes men around me. I want a staff of people who have the liberty and freedom to be able to say, you know, Pastor, uh, have you thought about this or one you look like? I don't want, nobody can grow with yes men. And you've asked your wife to be your, your yes woman, and she can't tell you what your issue is? She says, baby, the reason why the church is not growing is you're so doggone mean that you run everybody away that's around because you're trying to act like somebody else. Works for me. I'm, I'm not on my way to divorce court. Now, if you want to keep living that same old religious, traditional thing, it's not working. And you want to know why marriages, the divorce rate is stronger amongst Christian people? It's because we fake. And we perfected phoniness so much that you wouldn't dare talk about what's really going on in that house because it messes up your image because we're into building images and not really building the body of Christ and building people. And so you have to keep this stuff to yourself until something happens and you explode. That's no fun. That's not what grace wants to happen in your life. There's a grace on a woman. There's a grace on a man. Well, who gets to make the decisions? Well, hopefully we both go to God and find out what he wants done and then we sit down and talk to one another to see wh wh which part of what he wants done that we're, you're, you're graced to do this part, I'm graced to do this part. I mean, Taffy and I did that with washing. I mean, God doesn't care about that. I mean, we didn't have to go to God and say, Lord, who should do the washing and who should be the clean? We sat down and says, all right, I said, I'm anointed to wash. She says, I'm anointed to fold. Doom, we got it right there. I do the washing, she do the folding. I put a load of clothes on this morning. I'm done. 
When they come out the dryer, dryer, then she got to figure that out. But you come and you communicate your graces and you eliminate all weaknesses when you recognize one another's strengths. I rest my case. I got to ask, where'd she get that from? That thing almost made me, that, that, that looked sexy to me when she did that. Boy, I like, I rest my case. I like, we need to go home and rest some more. That, that, that did something to me. I felt something. In the city of my soul, hallelujah, glory to God. <laughs> Just like the other day she walked in and, and I, was, I was sweeping and, and, and cleaned the kitchen up and she walked in and paused and looked at me and she said, boy, you sure look sexy with that broom in your hand. <laughs> I ran in the, in, the, in, the, in the laundry room, maybe if I get a mop, I even look more sexier. <laughs> I can just sit up there, how this look? Man, this has been some kind of morning. And it, won't you give the Lord a big hand clap for praise? Just thank him for everything. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. God is so good. Amen. Oh, man. This is only, a, what, a day and a half? A day and a half. And look what's invaded uh, your mind already. Oh, praise the Lord.